that's it. Right, is this, is this one you're seeing, Sunshine Sagittarius? The one that you were looking at, sorry, um, that I obviously shared incorrectly was the side of real one, which is actually what um, I was being asked to share by um, someone that was heckling me last week. Oh, well, that's fine. I, this is the one that makes more sense to me because... <laughs> this is Sagittarius. Yes. I can bring up the side of real one um, just to show you what they look like. Um, you know, okay, that perfect. something people are interested in. So the, other thing, these... the other nice thing about this is it's bigger and it's easy to see. <laughs> well, these, um, these, these are all the planets that we're looking at. Um, and the feminine, the feminine ones really give us a balance when we're looking at astrology because most of the planets have a masculine expression. I think Saturn is very much about discipline and rules and regulations and getting things um, just so um, and creating form as well. But again, it's a very masculine endeavor. Pluto is very much about um, control, total control, um, and um, can be almost maniacal um, and creating deep trauma with the need for control um, that has a sort of resonance in our lives <laughs> it hits us all at some point and uranus um the sort of searing um, ripping effect that uranus creates in our charts um is often um very very masculine it's, it's shocking um in, in the way that it works so these goddess asteroids ceres juno Pallas athena and vesta are quite good at balancing those out and if you don't already know um the positions of those I think they're, they're probably quite good to look at within your own charts because they, they give so much more of a description. Now, the thing that I think is really interesting about um, Gillian's chart is that she's born um, in, in a time when there's a really interesting transit going on, which goes on for a good few years. And Gillian is born in the year when it's at its most acute and um, difficult stage, <laughs> um, which is... You have a look here we've got what's known as a t-square um between we've got saturn and chiron the wounded healer in pisces and we've got pluto and uranus in um, virgo in complete opposition now if we think about the this uh, when i look at a birth chart I, I think a lot of people probably go to the sun and the moon first or they might read the first house the second house the third house and go round in a birth chart to try and understand um, uh, in a logical way how somebody works. But the way that works best for me, I think, is to go where I'm pulled. And when I look at a, a chart, I, the first thing I want to do is suss out the sacred geometry that shows up. I really like to look at the shapes that come up. And what, what shapes can you guys see in, in um, Gillian's chart? I'm quite intrigued. Um, can it, can anyone what, what what shapes can you see Jenny I've just unmuted you <laughs> and I just unmuted I you am see I'm seeing triangles I'm seeing pyramids, pyramids. I am seeing what looks like 5d I'm always almost looking at it and seeing it like different facets of a diamond if that makes sense yeah yeah definitely um, is there anything you would add in or, or say differently to that, Anne? I, I saw a pyramid. I, mm. I saw pyramids. Yeah, um, Gillian's chart is quite nice because it almost looks like there is a, um, what's it called, yeah. a pentagram. <laughs> yeah, yes. I saw that over at the, the left beside the Leo bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it has got a lot of shapes in it. Um, uh, the the blue playtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The blue, um, the blue aspects um, are very, very flowing, and the mm. reds are, are quite challenging. But we've got this very strong, what's known as a T square, which almost forms into a grand square, which would be an exact square but it's it's kind of slightly mm. off center we've got this lovely um grand trine energy where you see an equilateral triangle yeah. you've also got what's known as a mystic rectangle which i'm just demonstrating here um you've got a couple of very strong oppositions um where i'm going with my um mouse and so uh, 
and then also because of all of these being an aspect they create these lovely little green imaginative and creative aspects um mm -hmm. which are quite difficult to understand um they're not easy flowing but they're definitely a gift um, but they take a bit of challenge and hard work to to recognize so jillian has got a lot of things going on in her chart um and it looks to me like when i look at a chart like this i it, my instinct is to say wow she came through a portal um because that's what it's like it, it's like this, mm. this portal of energy just um drawing you in um but probably the first place I would go would be here. Um, I don't know, where, where, did, where are your eyes drawn um, when you look at Gillian's chart? I was drawn to the left where, I think, is it Leo? I was seeing a star appear there, but also uh -huh. the opposite side. Mm -hmm. where well right, a, right across. Oh, here? Um, yeah, that bit. Right, yes. okay, towards the descendant. I'm seeing that, yeah. And the other bit was down at the very bottom where there are all the, pla the planets. Is that in Sagittarius? Yeah, um, yeah. It almost felt like it was anchoring everything. Yeah. Do you mind if I um, bring a certain somebody into the room who would like to say hello? He's a little oh. bit upset. Oh! Say hello, Solomon. Hello. <laughs> Oh, I might have to lift him up a bit. This little guy might need a milk, a bit of milk while I do this. <laughs> he's just woken up, but he's only six months old. And um, unfortunately, unfortunately, no no amount of bouncing downstairs is helping him. So um, I'll do this. Oh, 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 oh. I'll just see if I can match him. Okay. Hang on. Let's see if we can sort you out. There we go. Hang on. There we go. Come on. Oh, you know when you cry so much that you can't breathe? Aww. Makes it very difficult to suck milk, doesn't it, when you can't breathe? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, take a deep breath. Okay. So we're back in the room. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because a chart like this, um, there are so many different aspects that you would want to talk about. And um, I guess as an astrologer, you, you know, if, if you're trying to do it in a, in a lot of time, you'd probably think, okay, what, what's going to create the most impact mm -hmm. first? Um, I think um, there's a couple of things that I like to um, do, which I think add value quite quickly. One of them is to think about, um, is anyone familiar with transactional analysis? Yes. Yes. So parent, adult and child behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easy to see transactional analysis preferences when you look at the position of the sun, the moon and Saturn. So the sun represents our adult self and our ego and um, what most people get from us, I think. The moon represents um, our childhood and our innocence and also um, the, the childlike plays we might um, rely on in our repertoire mm -hmm. and Saturn represents how we might be par parental so if you think of transactional analysis which is quite a useful psychological tool like the parent in us could be um, if the Saturn is well expressed the parent in us can be um, really nurturing create really useful forms and structures if it's quite challenged then um, it often shows up as having quite a harsh or critical parent around or a harsh and critical, oh, he's pulling my earphones, <laughs> and my headphones. Um, so, so the Saturn, the Saturn and the Sun often represent um, a male parent or the stronger, most outward parent. So I like to look for the sort of parenting archetypes that come up in, in charts because most of our psychology um, comes from them. Um, so Saturn definitely shows up um, as being quite useful. And given that Saturn here in Pisces um, is conjunct Chiron, the wounded healer, that is very, very strong. Um, now, I love the outer planets, the slow moving planets. So um, I tend to skip the sun and the moon and Venus and 
Mercury and Mars for a little bit because their their impacts are um, light. You know, they give us our basic personality and our preferences, but they don't really speak of the real trauma that goes on in our lives. And I think it's the trauma that often shapes us. Mm -hmm. And so Gillian's Saturn and Chiron together, um, we're thinking... Um, parent, stroke, authority, authority figures, institutions, all those things that rule Saturn things and wounds from pain um, are in a sort of same. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to mute that one. <laughs> Whose dog is that? Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. It's um, it's like a, it's like a friends and family um episode, you know, because I've got um, I've got Solomon on in my arms. We got your dog, <laughs> and I think you've unmuted yourself again. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, I'll... I've done that. <laughs> so um, so we've got Saturn and Chiron in Pisces, which gives a really really strong um signature to Gillian's chart, especially because she's got asteroid talent in the mix. So. Um, if, and, and talent is also in the sign of Pisces. Now, Pisces as a sign energy is really much about, it's, a, it's about healing um, and transcendence. Pisces um, at one level can be read with, um, if you think of creativity, the Pisces creativity, when it's um, inspired and positive and comfortable, then it, it will go transcendent um, and unconditional. But Pisces at its lower, more unconscious level is quite confusing and um, murky at times. So Gillian has got a talent in understanding um, the, the, the levels of creativity that mankind goes through, I think, and also going into those places. Um, it helps Gillian. I think it, it's fair to say that Gillian has a, a tendency to be able to go beyond the veils, which is really a Pisces concept. You know, to be able to go in and out, um, to drift in and out of situations and sense things. Pisces really don't have any boundaries. The Pisces energy is unboundaried. It's um, like an ocean. Um, and what, what you focus on, you see, but everything else goes into darkness. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a tough sign if you've got a lot of Pisces. Um, I've got a ton of Pisces in my chart as well. And it takes quite a long time to get to grips with it because you can't quite put your finger on Pisces. So Gillian's got a talent to put her finger on things that's very, very difficult to explain, I guess, especially in relation to um, um, difficulties between boundaries between people um, to do with hurts and pains from childhood that come up from um, repression, oppression, um, punishment, um, um, strong male archetypes i don't want to um, divide male and female um like Gillian, i i really don't find that very useful either um, and, and on the other side of Gillian's chart we've got pluto in um a tight conjunction with uranus um so again these these planets move so slowly that when they move into alignment with each other they take a long time to move out of alignment so this um this opposition between these planets came on very, very slowly. So from 1964 until 1967, 68, they're still, you know, just working out the final kinks of this, this, this very um, challenging aspect. And everyone born around 1965, 1966 will have some um, part of it when it fits in with, um, your moon or your sun or your venus for instance like it fits in in jillian's chart so jillian's got her sun um in a square to chiron in a square to saturn and to talon and also in a square to pluto and uranus it feels like this theme is one of the biggest themes in her life whereas some people you know if they're born like five days later or ten days later their sun won't be anywhere near there you know just be shifted off so it's less of a focus. Or if somebody's, these, these angles here, the ascendant and the descendant, the midheaven and the part of the home, um, if, if these aspects 
or shifted around to one of these angles, then boy, would that create some some <laughs> some, some challenge. But as as these are all in um, a T square together, they they create some very um, inescapable themes for Gillian's chart. Um, and what I like about the North Node here in the sign of Taurus is the fact that the North Node is um, in a really nice trine, a flowing energy with Gillian's Pluto and Uranus. So there is this, um, uh, Pluto transforms and Uranus creates waves. So it's like there is this transforming wave machine <laughs> linking up. Gillian's fate in life um, and, and keeping her on her course. Um, so even when she um, tries to get off course and go her own way, this kind of like this wave effect pulls back um, and, 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 and draws her back in. And also the North Node um, is, is um, you know, connected up to the mid heaven as well, showing that what Gillian works on in her life and gets status or is known for in her life is really to do with her North Node, her spirituality, her core purpose. Um, so it, the themes that show up in Gillian's chart become her um, and become her, her main form of expression. Does that make sense? Um, so that's probably one of the first things. I mean, Pluto, the energy of um, utter control combined with the energy of surprise and shock and um, channeling as well. Uh, Uranus is, if you look at this, the symbol of Uranus, it's, it's like a TV aerial, isn't it, from the 1980s? <laughs> I remember growing up seeing those on people's roofs and thinking, how the hell are they balanced? They always looked like they were going to blow off, um, which they did actually, didn't they? They always used to fall off in, if there were high winds. Um, well, Uranus is a great channel channeler. Um, it's really about the airwaves. So we, we feel things in our waters and Gillian feels them in a very transforming and complete way, um, almost like a full bodied um, channeling, um, which being in a square to her son is not always comfortable. Um, it's something that really fits into her chart. Um, but, but it's not always that flowing or, or, or easy for her, um, from, from what I understand. Is that, would you agree with that, Gillian? Yes. <laughs> I was laughing when you were saying about it's all lovely because, Tor you know, because of the North Node and Taurus and it's, it keeps bringing it back into flow. The number of times I've thought, I've thought right, I'm just going to go and teach Reiki. <laughs> I don't ever get to do it. <laughs> yeah, because you're brought back to the purpose. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, um, and it's also um, pulled pulled right into the the planet Venus, which is to do with love, but also generosity, and also the feminine principle, um, and also innocence, um, and and those patterns almost shock, um, you know, innocence shock love it's it, it, it's quite shocking um on a on on a feminine front it, it's almost like well um i guess predominantly i would imagine did, did you get into the work that you do julian um because women were coming to you is it mean women that come to you i imagine now that you get an even spread between the sexes no at the beginning it was mostly men actually oh really no it's been mostly wow. well <sighs> Depends on which bit you look at, because um, I suppose the foundational stuff was the meetup group I was running, and that was really interesting. For spells, we'd get exactly equal numbers of men and women. Wow. And well, then there'd be other spells where they would just be, you know, sequential months, there'd be mostly men. Other times, there would be mostly women coming in, and it, it just seemed to go in waves. So <laughs> now it's been mixed, definitely mixed. Okay. And I would have said early on, there was more, way more there was way more men came to work with me, but that also kind of reflected where I was at. Mm. As I, I heal, uh, most of my historical issues have been with women, not with men. Right. You know, the men in my life have been, have been easy. Really supported, yeah. They've been easy and, you know, good, good guys. And then, mm. then it's been sort of, <laughs> the women weren't quite like that. 
So, yeah. well, I, you know, the, the predominant woman, <laughs> i.e. the mother. <laughs> um, you know, amazing woman, but no, no walk in the park at all. So, and, uh, you know, yeah. until I really, really, really healed that, that, that relationship and probably that relationship with me as woman. Um, yeah. And then that started reflecting and who was coming to me. But yeah. I, I can understand what you're saying now, actually. Um, and my, in fact, yeah, <laughs> I've, um, I've got a T-square between Pluto, Venus and Saturn as well. Uh, so uh, only my Saturn and Venus are in opposition, but my Venus is also um, square Pluto like yours. And it's made me very suspicious of, of women um, or it, it can create um, control issues uh, um, to do with women. Uh, I've found I've had lots of very, very strong women around me all my life. <laughs> and it's been very difficult for me to stand into my femininity. Um, I can be feminine, but I don't feel very strong in it um, necessarily. There's a, a kind of disconnect. Um, although I think you, you do very, very well there. Um, talking about your mum, because the mums, when I, when I do look at charts, first of all, um, and I'm looking at the parenting principles. So I said it with a transactional analysis that I often look at Saturn to represent how we parent and how we accept parenting. Um, the sun for how we um, look at our ego and the adult side of us and the moon to look at um, our innocence and our childhood. Um, I also do look at Ceres and the moon in combination together because Ceres is very much about um, the divine mum. If you think about Ceres and Demeter, uh, they're essentially the same character um, according to whether you're Roman or Greek. Um, but the story of her losing Persephone, her beloved daughter to the underworld, to Hades, funnily enough, who's also known as Pluto, um, she, she uses, loses her daughter to the underworld and because um, her daughter eats pomegranates, like half the pomegranates, her daughter has to stay in the underworld for half a year and then comes back. Sarah's or Demeter, this character up here, she, she goes into mourning um, for half the year and then brings about spring and summer when her daughter returns and then autumn and winter she goes into mourning. So Sarah's is... Um, often shows up as the mum because it shows a possessive mum. Um, it shows where we get possessive. It shows where we mourn the loss of our children. Um, and it, it can also show where we're really delightful as a mum as well. So I look at, at Ceres from a couple of angles. And what I notice normally is that where she's really um, benign and supported in a child, she often shows up as a really positive mum. And where she's quite stressed um, and angular, i.e. has squares, then her, her emotions tend to take precedent. Um, and, and it's very, very difficult to do anything other than observe the emotions of mummy. Um, so you've got Sarah's there and you've also got the moon down here. And the moon also represents our mums too. Um, for instance, my my um, my mum is a Pisces, and both me and my sister have both got our moon in Pisces, um, which doesn't always work like that. But in family astrology, our mums are often described by the moons of our children. Um, my three children have got my first two have got air sign moons, um, suggesting somebody um, like an astrologer or somebody who who talks about philosophy or thoughts and, and whatnot. But then moons are also in the 12th house to do with psychic energy or channeling. Um, and then my youngest has got his moon in Pisces like me. Um, again, it's, it's very much describing the kind of mum that I am or, or the things that I'm interested in. Um, so the moon often represents our mum. So I will look there as well. And Gillian Serres um, has got, a tight square to Pallas Athena um, to do with um, how she thinks and her patterning. I'm not entirely sure if she was very clear in her thought processes, um, whether she was able to really do them very smoothly. Um, it, it seemed that she might have got a bit stuck there, but she's very, very angular. She's 
she's in a very strong square to Mars, which shows that possibly she, um, I would, um, with her Mars in Libra, um, it's not one of Mars's favorite positions. So her aggression is likely not to come out too aggressively. Um, it's more likely that she is passive aggressive. So will, um, especially with this Ceres to Mars square, she's much more likely to express it um, in other ways, like um, guilt trips, I would imagine, you know, like making people feel a bit guilty for almost being alive or for disappointing. Is this, <laughs> um, is this me or my mother? Your mum. Oh, yeah, oh, no, no, definitely. She was <laughs> Not you. <laughs> although, although as we do read um, about our mums, um, those patterns are within ourselves and it's, it's our choice whether we express them or not. And so often, um, um, in, in the same way that we might hear ourselves and channel our parents from time to time, because no matter how much we dislike our parents or love our parents um, or decide we're going to make a change from our parents, we still come out with their scripts from time to time when we don't catch ourselves or, or when we're stressed. Um, but... It's, it's possible that, you know, the higher expression of, or the resolved expression of Ceres in a square to Mars is that um, Ceres realises where she's mourning, she realises where she's possessive, and she can take some positive action about it and let go of her children in a positive way or take an interest in her children to have their own lives. So it, it's quite possible that... Um, um, the same aspect can be um, reflected on an unconscious and low level or at a higher level and in full consciousness. So I guess what I like to see in, in charts um, and through talking with my clients, that's why I like to talk to, with my clients to get an idea as to um, where they've transformed in their own lives and whether when I'm reading their charts, I'm reading it from um, a slightly hidden message or whether they're really well aware of what's going on for them. Looks like you wanted to say something there, Anne. Um, I'm just going to unmute you for a sec. Carefully. Just Hello, sorry. Carefully. Just listening to you. So oh, okay. No, just <laughs> listening, sorry. <laughs> You're listening very intently, it's lovely. <laughs> um, is there anything you wanted to ask at all? No, no, I'm just, I'm just listening to you oh, talking okay. about things. Oh, okay. What about you, Jenny? Are you okay there? Yes, I'm fine. I'm following what's said. Okay. It's absolutely fascinating. Has having <laughs> met Julian in person and known her on social media beforehand. Yeah, it's very <laughs> illuminating. <laughs> I, I mean, I love Charles. Um, oh, you're welcome. So welcome. And thank you, Julian, for letting us do this as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess when I look at charts now, um, and this is a, a recent development, I almost look at them and feel like I've become them for a moment. Um, I guess, um, you know, when you, you work in, in a healing modality, it's, it's quite normal, isn't it, to feel and I guess, especially if you don't have the boundaries, if, um, you know, with my strong Pisces, I tend to go to a real feeling place at the moment. So when I look at Gillian's chart, I start to feel things or I start to get images come up and, uh, and whatnot or, or, or words and, and stuff. And you can get those. You can retroactively go back and say, well, that's because of Pluto conjunct Uranus. But I think um, also looking at a birth chart can also be... Um, well, I'm starting to realise it's like um, a, a light language in itself. Um, on a different level, you can connect into it and get messages on multiple levels, um, and and maybe there's something encoded there. I don't know. My my um, views on astrology are, are deepening exponentially at the moment. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing um, some kind of upward surge <laughs> at the moment with energy. <laughs> Jenny's nodding, so I think so, and Anne as well. Um, Gillian, where would you like me to focus on next? I was just going to say there's an upward surge on everything at the moment, isn't there? There is, isn't there? Yeah. Um, the era of magic coming back in again. Yes, yes. 
yes, yes, yes. Um, I don't I, mind so much. It's just because I think it's just quite interesting just giving this opportunity of people. Is there anything anybody else wants to ask about? Can you just remind me what, you know, the dotty green lines, because you did tell yeah. me about this, what you see in those, because I think they're quite interesting. I just really like the pattern of them. Yeah, they're, they're pretty awesome, actually. Um, you don't get, th this is like Quincunx, <laughs> it's a strange old um, um, aspect with its, its funny old name. Um, it's known by a couple of names, actually. But these um, aspects, um, I should say that the, the um, squares and oppositions work in multiples of twos and fours, essentially, because the, the um, oppositions divide the chart into two. The squares divide the charts into four. Um, the trines and the sextiles, the sextiles have got six energy. They go every two signs. And if you had a sextile from Jupiter up here, you'd have what's known as a grand trine, which is two, two triangles creating a star of David. Um, and I know I have actually created a star of David with your chart before, Gillian, when we added in some extra asteroids and there was an asteroid just here, just making that possible. Um, so you've got sixes and then you've got energies of three um, with the triangles with 120 degrees. These um, aspects have a vibration akin to seven. And if you're interested in numerology, sevens are, are very deep um, and difficult to fathom. Um, they're a bit lonerish, the seven energy. So, but they're also very talented because they are so quiet and they observe and, and um, they study quite fastidiously. In fact, I'm in a seven year right now and um, I'm lost in thoughts a lot <laughs> of the time. You go really deep. And so I think these energies really show deep, deep action um, working through our charts. And um, occasionally you might just get like one arrowhead, you know, like um, this one coming down to here and that one going down to there. And you'd look at this and say, okay, that's a focus point of this chart. But of course, Gillian <laughs> has got a focus here, a focus there, a focus here, um, and, and one here as well. But each of these like arrowheads shows, um, to my mind, it shows one way that Gillian could resolve her chart. It shows one possible way you could resolve the chart. So, um, for instance, this, this arrow coming here towards Gillian's ascendant, the ascendant is very much about um, how Gillian is perceived, her personality. Um, um, it's like Gillian's wrapper. Um, if she was a chocolate bar, the... Um, and, and sorry to use chocolate bar. Um, I'll, I'll make her a vegan chocolate bar <laughs> and maybe a raw chocolate vegan bar. Um, so that um, that works with you, Jenny. <laughs> um, so the I'm going around this the image of the sun here. So Gillian's sun is the main flavour of the chocolate bar. It's the it's the chocolate bar you're buying. Um, it's the taste. Um, it's it, it's what you know. The wrapper is Gillian's ascendant. It's the first thing you notice about it. And then the moon is the aftertaste, the feeling you get once you've consumed it and how you connect to her. So the ascendant is really the wrapper. And the wrapper doesn't necessarily talk about the content of who Gillian really is. It's just what people know about her. So one way that Gillian could maybe resolve some of these conflicts would be to focus on what people know about her and allow herself as a person to become kind of like an entity in public. And in fact, lots of people do know you, Gillian, um, or know of you um, because of what they think they know about you, um, myself included, because I've never actually met you in, in real life, have I? Apart from having a, you know, Skype conversations. <laughs> and that's, we've never physically been in the same place together. Um, Although arguably, um, I guess that depends on, on your views on life and stuff, because we're all together now, aren't we? But so Gillian could resolve 
some of her challenges, in particular this one down here, down to the moon and Mercury, how she thinks and, and how her thoughts influence her emotions, could be resolved by becoming very public and, and, and having a public face. In fact, this ties into the vertex. And if you've used the vertex before, it's, it's quite a wonderful little point, actually. Um, when I look at relationship charts, I often, oh, we've got Alice in here now. Hi, Alice. Um, when I look at relationship charts, um, the vertex often shows us where, um, hang on, it looks like someone's asking me something in chat. Oh, Alice has just said hello. <laughs> Hi, Alice. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking me so long to get there. I was sort of daydreaming whilst looking at Gillian's chart. So um, we've got someone called Cassie as well. Hi, Cassie. Um, the Vertex shows us what the universe is asking for us to get involved in, in life. So um, many of us, when we grow up, people ask us, what do you want to be when you're older? And, um, and you know, you might want to be a teacher or a doctor or a dancer, a princess, whatever. I don't know lots of different funny jobs we have ideas about. And I don't suppose any of us are actually doing those things we wanted to do as kids. Am I right? <laughs> um, but the Vertex. It shows what the universe is, is urging us to do. And I think the vertex and its point exactly opposite, which is called the anti-vertex, which is right by Gillian's Jupiter. It's not actually shown here. But the anti-vertex shows the people that come into our world to get us on track as to what the universe wants us to do. So the universe is, is always focusing Gillian back to the fifth house endeavours in particular in Aquarius. Um, so the fifth house is about creativity. It's about the womb. It's about the sacred portal that is the womb and that is sexuality. Um, it's also about birthing, giving birth, um, giving birth to new projects, being really creative. It's about romance. Um, it's, it's about so many different things. Um, but I also think it's a place of love and innocence. Um, the fifth house is the natural ruler of, uh, is naturally ruled by Leo. And so if you think of Leo energy, Leo is very playful and spontaneous and creative and very, very innocent in, in wanting to um, be fun. You can hear a bit of disturbance in the background um, and flashing lights. I don't know if you can see any lights coming in my window, but um, it looks like the skips down the road are being changed and it's, like five past ten at night, you wouldn't have that in the UK, would you? <laughs> You'd have all the Brits up in arms going, <gasps> burning their MP and whatnot. But <laughs> in Portugal, um, bins are emptied at five past ten at night by a big skip, skip collector. So one of the ways Gillian can um, resolve her personality and the challenges in her chart is through A, being a person that is what is well known for what she does and B from working on womb issues or working on the sacred portals of creativity and like, where does creativity come from I think it's stuff we give birth to whether we give birth to it actually from our wombs but um, I think like the cervix the opening to the womb is like a portal into the universe and I might be going a bit crazy here but like what exists? Does anyone actually know? I mean, doctors will say you go, you know, you go up there and there's a little bit of space and if there's a baby inside, there it is, you know. But beyond that, the womb is is rubbish. But if you think about the um, chakra area, the sacral, the, you know, it's it's all about creativity and giving birth. And so, so, so that's something that Gillian can get involved in. And then up here, she could be the sacred mum. This is Sarah's another way she could resolve her life. And her Sarah's is in, um, in cancer, the sign of the eternal mum. And cancer is also very much linked into finding narratives in life and finding the stories, the histories that we create our traditions on. Cancer's really traditional. And Sarah's to do with mothering um, is, is really, really cool here. Um, there's a little bit more conversation going on in the chat box. Um, Apologies, my video is not working at the moment. Oh, Alice, that's fine. Um, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, don't worry. It's just it's just nice that you've made it. Um, so that's another way that Gillian could 
resolve her personality. So that's why I quite like these little green aspects because they're a bit of a challenge. Um, Cause no doubt, Gillian, do you sometimes wish you weren't in the public eye? <laughs> oh, hang on. Sorry, I just, I just muted, unmuted myself. Um, can I just check in? It's funny cause I, I haven't heard you say that before. Um, oh. The way I use Facebook, I think, I think it's part of that, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because I, I mean, for a lot, you know, for a long, long time, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing with this. I'll just stick it all over Facebook. That's been my approach to things. And I know that lots of people come to me through stuff I, I post on Facebook. Yeah. And it yeah, and it, it is interesting watching sometimes the reflection that comes back because I'll post something on Facebook and what comes back is not a reflection of what I was intending to put out there, but it's fine too. But it creates it creates conversation, doesn't it? It creates a connection. Um, and well, sometimes what I post out there, it's not even really. I, I'm not even sure I believe it, but it's fine. It, was, <laughs> it kind of holds that space for other people who need that space. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So does that does that answer your question, Gillian, about the the green yeah. aspects? Okay. Um, um, we, we started a bit late, so I'm happy to carry on for a bit longer. And um, Solomon um, is now napping on my boob, so <laughs> he's fast asleep. So I'm Can happy I, to carry on if you guys are. Because I know that Lilith isn't anywhere. And I know Lilith, I find Lilith very much a key part of my chart, but the, you haven't got it on this, have you? I didn't put it on um, today. Um, however, I can go, um, I'll have to unshare... Um, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. I mean, it was just, I, I was just going to mention about that because it, it, I find the Lilith, because there's the three different mm. archetypes of Lilith that you um, share quite often and um, they always feel quite a strong part of my chart. Yeah. Um, because um, what's the three? There's one which is basically the pissed off Lilith, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> there's one um, which is Lilith and, you know, almost in her innocence. And there's another one. I can't remember what the third one is. Um, oh, crikey. You've got the dark moon Lilith, the black moon Lilith, and um, uh, asteroid Lilith. Um, and then one of them is also known as Waldemouth. Uh, Waldemouth. Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember which one's which. Um, yeah. Because they've all got similar names, um, I like to look at the symbols and have a little crib sheet in front of me <laughs> to make yeah, sure I, I get them I, right. I seem to remember one of them's quite close to my Chiron. Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. Um, and it's, it's so, so Chiron being the wounded healer and then Lilith, um, I think that's the, the sort of more reasonable Lilith, isn't it, that's in there. Yeah. But to be yeah. honest, so Lilith to me is, is that... Um, yeah. It's that, you know, it's that sort of first woman that would not be, you know, wouldn't lie beneath Adam, you know, who's yeah. just really strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just find that quite interesting to sort of add in. And I can't remember where the sort of snarky Lilith goes, but. <laughs> <laughs> They're all a little bit snarky. Yeah, um, no, no, they don't take any shit, but it's just. No, same they don't. Yeah. Sorry, I just um, remember putting this up on YouTube. I hope nobody minds me. Oh, no, I, I have absolutely no problem with when that. You think <laughs> anyone that. I think any language is fair enough. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, one of the interesting things about your Lilith, um, like you're right, it, it is in the seventh house. If you imagine it being about around here, I think that's about right. Um, and it, um, I think it might be a bit lower, actually, because I think it's also um, near your descendant. Now, the descendant, like if you think of the ascendant being the wrapper, the chocolate wrapper that I described, um, you know, how people perceive you um, and how you come across. Um, the descendant is the projections that you, the, the things in yourself that you don't accept sometimes um, that you put on other people. <laughs> um, the descendant shows everybody else that shows up in your life that's not you. And of course, if there's something undiagnosed about yourself um, or unrecognized in yourself you see it in everybody else um, and possibly people see it in you as well so the descendant often shows us the things that we um, put on other people and and that's why 
we often get lovers and enemies in the same place because lovers often become enemies <laughs> you know when things don't get managed very well or um, enemies can become lovers but often the people we like and dislike um, are very similar it's a really fine line between love and hate um, and so often anything to do with other people shows up around here so if, um, what I didn't say at the start of this was all these green symbols around the outside they're the current positions of all the planets and all of these guys that I've put in Jillian's chart are shown up here in their current positions now so if one of these is crossing the descendant then I think okay something huge is going on and somebody else is bringing it into Jillian's life right now. And one of the things that um, um, can be quite painful is when Lilith is crossing the descendant, because often other people will come to you um, and create some kind of, and I'm going to swear now, some kind of, it's a minor swear word, by the way, um, they'll create some kind of shitstorm <laughs> um, in your life to do with... Um, feeling repressed, feeling oppressed, because Lilith, the archetype, is very much about repression and where we feel that people aren't taking us seriously. In fact, people are mocking us or um, deliberately keeping us in place as a, a small little unexpressed woman. Um, and obviously Lilith does show up in the charts of men as well. You know, we all go through this energy. Um, you know, it's great if Lilith isn't our mums. <laughs> if it is our mums, then it's, oh God, you know, it's a real pisser. Oh, I swore again, excuse me. Um, so <laughs> uh, having Lilith going over the descendant creates all sorts of, uh, it unleashes hell. Um, and um, yeah, and if your Lilith is here at the same time, then this creates problems. Now, one of the Liliths has... Um, I think an orbit of two years, four months. And then another one has a nine year cycle. And the nine year cycle is the one that's about resolving the Lilith issues. Um, and I like numerology because if you think about the numbers, we are on a nine year cycle. Um, and that fits in very nicely with the Lilith cycle because it is pretty much nine years. Um, and so the, the thing that we find um, at the start of the nine years that that our, our position as a woman or our position as someone that is is expressed gets challenged again um and so we have a chance to ex re-express ourselves in a way to find freedom so these nine year cycles are quite interesting so when lilith goes over your natal lilith or your Chiron or your Saturn, in which case they would go over Jillian's all at the same time. Or if, her Lil or if this Lilith, this slow moving Lilith goes over Pluto and Uranus, then, you know, this is going to be quite difficult. Um, or over the Ascendant, or this would be really hard actually, <laughs> going over the um, IC, the part of the home. It's the seat, the real core of our charts. Um, I, I went through you know, I've been learning about astrology since I was 10, really. That's when I first started getting interested in it. And um, I really paid not very much attention to this point for a really long time because it wasn't relevant. But boy, when you have something going over it <laughs> or um, the ruler of it does something a bit funky, all of a sudden your life gets very disruptive. So if you had Lilith going over this point of your home, your house, how you see yourself, like the, the, your core emotions and behaviors come from your childhood, the seat of your emotions. This, it's the lowest part of our chart. It's the, the bit that we really want to keep private. Um, I think the IC and MC are almost like um, an axis between our private hidden sides and our public personas that people see. And this is, public and uh, all about me and this is all about you um, and this side of the chart is all about what people see and then this lower part of the chart is about what we don't let people see so um you know Gillian for instance Gillian with her Neptune to do with high levels of sensitivity being right here at the seat of the home um 
it's very difficult to manage. Really, really difficult, um, especially in the sign of Scorpio, um, which is a very um, um, deep and often confusing energy to, to manage. Having Neptune right there shows so much energy and so many feelings um, that it's very difficult to articulate what's going on and probably took you many years to be able to pin your finger on it. Is that, would you agree with that, Julian? I'm not sure I've not yet ma uh, mastered it, but yes, it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you're definitely a lot more sensitive than most people. I, I mean, it's, it's almost hypersensitive um, having Neptune right there on, on the IC. It's a, it's a very um, important point in our charts, having Neptune there. Um, oh, and Neptune and Scorpio and everything all tangled up together. And then, so I, there's, I don't miss anything. No, you don't. And um, I see it all. And that, that tends, that, so I quite often get that reflected back from other people. A lot of people avoid me when things, uh, when anything brown is hitting their fan, their personal <laughs> They tend to be avoid tend to avoid me at the time because they know I I'll see it. Yeah, is that yeah. is that yeah. part of that same pattern? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, because Neptune. Um, when also when you're looking at a chart, um, it's worth thinking which star sign does ne is Neptune the ruler of, um, and Neptune rules Pisces. What is the cusp? By what this this is these these lines here in between the houses are known as cusps. So an astrologer would say, which, which cusp is the um, ruler Neptune on? Oh, it's the descendant. Oh, another big angle. So <laughs> Neptune is right on, like really conjunct this really important private part of you and is also the ruler of your relationships. So it's no surprise that with your hyper levels of sensitivity that you, you can see other people's projections. And then if something goes over this point, like Lilith, um, to connect with your late natal Lilith and then your Chiron and your Saturn, um, people, people don't like, um, you know, people will project onto you and if you look at Neptune, Neptune almost looks a bit like a hook as well. <laughs> they hook onto you. They hook, in, they, they hook their energy into you, but then they don't like it up them, you know. I was <laughs> like, like a trident. Yeah. yeah. Neptune looks like a trident. So, yes. It is. It is a trident for sure. They don't have um, a problem sticking that up my backside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And it's like the sign of Pisces has two tridents on it in opposite directions. Um, yeah, and right now, Neptune, bearing in mind, Neptune is one of the most important planets um, in your chart because it rules the Descendant and it's conjunct the IC. Um, the ruler of your chart is actually Mercury, which is the ruler of the Ascendant. Now, your Mercury, oh, it's in conjunction with Neptune. How interesting. <laughs> so your angles, this one, this one, and this one are all tied up in the fourth house to do with home and childhood and what came from your home and childhood um, has had an effect on how you appear to others, how others are with you and what goes on um, with your behaviours, your emotions, your home. And probably, especially with your sun and your moon here as well, you much prefer to be on home territory, work from home, um, do all your thinking from home. Probably a bit of a hermit on the slide. I know you went around the world last year, but and, and just come back from Paris, wanting around. <laughs> I imagine no, that's no, a really important place. I stay at home and I keep to my own company most of the time, if I'm honest. But it is yeah. also interesting. I'm much more comfortable to have people visit in my own in my space. Yeah. In my space. I totally get that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which is kind kind of unusual given that you've got your um moon in Sagittarius and your sun in Sagittarius. Um, well, I like traveling as well, but it's just, yeah, yeah. I like to come home and hide. So. Yeah. That's more recent, to be fair. The sort of, uh, really, the sort of hermit thing has definitely escalated in the last 
it's just at the moment everything is so strong that mm. I have to come back and have time on my own. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I can see, you know, going on here is Neptune, which is obviously one heck of a big planet in your chart. Um, Neptune currently is right in between <laughs> um, Chiron, the wounded healer, and Saturn. So Neptune, if you imagine um, a pin, like, you know, the uh, uh, arcades, where there's a pinball machine. And if you imagine Chiron and Saturn are holes in the pinball machine, right now there's a Neptune ball being <laughs> going around this pinball machine going do 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 and it's just hitting everything. <laughs> it's it's lining up and hitting on the Saturn bit and the Chiron bit. It's it's triggering all the Saturn Chiron and talent. I mean, the good thing is all the things it's, it's triggering at the moment um, do tie into the work that you do, Gillian. So there's no end of work for you. Um, there's, there's, so, there's, there's always going to be people that um, want to give form to their hurts and want to understand them. Um, however, whilst Neptune is over this, Neptune is a planet to do with confusion and delusion and sorry, delusion and illusion, you know, all sides of creativity and the veils, seeing into the veils, seeing beyond the veils. Um, it's, it's all there. I feel like I want to give Alice a voice at the moment. Is that okay, Alice? Um, let's see if I can unmute you. I don't know, you might be a bit secret. You might not want that. You might have nodded off. I can't see. <laughs> I can't unmute her. Never mind. Um, oh, no, no, we, we can't hear from Alice, never mind. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a lot going on. And Neptune is also, while it's impacting Saturn and Chiron, is also in opposition to Pluto and Uranus. Not, well, it's, yeah, it's right in between um, Pluto. And the last planet it's going to impact is Uranus. So that's, that's quite big. You know, these are really big um, times for you, Gillian, you know, having Neptune there, which is such an important planet to you. Does that all make sense? And so the fact that we also know that Lilith is also messing around in this area for the rest of the year as well, um, just adds so much more drama. Um, and um, <laughs> it adds to the theme. Anywhere else you'd like to go? Um, should we wanna... open it up in the chat? If, I mean, yeah, if I think so. She can ask in the chat. Yeah. Right, well, I've just unmuted um, Anne and Jenny. Thank you. That is <laughs> such an interesting chart. <laughs> it fascinates me all the information that you shared about Lilith. Mm. Lilith. Because it was only, you did a, a mini eclipse reading for me a couple of years ago. That's right. And I've taken a heap of notes from this because I'd never heard of Lilith and the other goddesses being used in this way. Uh-huh. And, yeah, it just seemed to be such a lot going on with those aspects. Yeah. And you've really helped demystify because astrology is something that has, I find it fascinating. But when it comes to charts and working out angles and stuff, it mm -hmm. just does not make much sense. But you broke that down in such a way that it was much easier to make sense of for my ascending brain. I'm not doing sort of logical and linear particularly well just now. I don't know if Gillian can identify with that I've got days of great brain scramble and just listening to how you intuitively interpret it something's going aha and <laughs> what you're seeing is just making a lot of sense oh. and I've just I just feel I've learned such a lot in going through the whole process that's really lovely to hear thanks Jenny um it's interesting what um 
uh, Gillian said at, at the start, which was, or well, not at the start, just um, some, some way in that I'd never actually shared that when I've looked at your chart before. Um, and that's the thing is, the more you work on a chart, the more you see. Mm. Um, mm. And in light with your comment about um, Lilith and other asteroids, um, for instance, when uh, about in the last year or so, I've started using named asteroids because they give even more um, descriptions. And oh. I got to know an astrologer in, in the States who uses named asteroids. So for instance, there are over 10,000 asteroids and there's probably, <laughs> there's probably an asteroid Jenny. There's probably an asteroid Anne or Beryl. Jesus. There's undoubtedly a Slater. <laughs> um, there's an asteroid Portugal. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's so many asteroids. And some of the asteroids can be used um, to describe work. So, for instance, a lot of my clients um, do a certain amount of writing or teaching. And there's an asteroid right. Um, it's not spelt as in R I. Sorry, W R. Oh, God, how do I spell? You taught me to spell W R I T E. It's W R I G H T, as in the surname, right? Um, but what um, my, uh, I guess, astrology uh, co colleague across the waters has taught me is that you select the asteroid that has the right sound or the right vibration. So it doesn't always have to have the same sound. So, for instance, um, uh, like my, my surname, I was trying to find Munson. I couldn't find Munson, but then I remember meeting somebody in Portugal who was from Venezuela who said, oh, you've got the same surname as me. And I said, really? Wow. And her, her surname is spelled Monzon, M-O-N-Z-O-N. And she said, well, it's a different spelling, but it has the same sound. And I looked up asteroid mm -hmm. Monzon, and sure enough, it, Ooh, it's perfect. really prominent in my chart. So um, uh, people, people have been contacting me when they've had issues with their employers or when they're thinking about doing a new project or some when they're choosing between lovers even. And I will input the asteroids to describe the situation they're in and they fit into the charts. Um, whether they fit into the charts at birth, you know, like, they, you know, there might be something there or on your no north node or... Or there might be, um, the asteroid might be just going over a particular point. Sorry, Michael. That's okay. Um, so the, the asteroid might be going over the particular point at the time of the question. Um, so I'm using asteroids in ever more creative ways. And the way I think about it is, you're all talking about how magical this world is at the moment and how we're really connected. Um, I'm seeing... Um, the astrology that I started learning, um, you know, in, in my youth um, as being 3D astrology and I'm seeing now adding in the asteroids, it's like taking it to another level. I, you know, I'm not claiming it either because so, much sense. so many people are doing it, but, but using asteroids, it, it makes it five dimensional or six dimensional. It takes mm. it. You can go um, into the birth chart, in, into so many layers upon layers. And every time I look at a chart, I can see so much more. So whereas 20 years ago, you might go to an astrologer and they, they always use the same planets and they, they, they use the same types of transit. Now you can really do situational astrology um, to a much greater depth. Um, the, I mean, the strange thing is you can probably come to the same conclusions just using the planets. Because um, I do think there is also... Um, a, a big argument for purism as well you know that sometimes you can have too many tools at your disposal but um, I do I do quite like using them um, they're quite interesting and that's really talent um, I've never known it to let me down it just seems to resonate with where our talent is in our charts um, and it's really easy um, if, if you use um, www.astro.com um, which this is where I'm using today. Um, I do have astrology programs, but this is a free one on the internet. Um, and if you put in your time, place and date of birth and set up a, an account, um, a free account, you can bring up your chart um, and under their extended chart um, selections, you can add in asteroids. 
and they've oh. got uh, the director of 10,000 Asteroids. So you can go in as, as deep as, as you'd like to. Wow. Um, Thanks. And then, oh, uh, welcome. And, and for people that really resonate with Roman and Greek mythology, if you love mythology or old characters from Dickens or something, you could look up the asteroids of those names. So for instance, um, the, I don't know if there's an asteroid screwed. There might be. Um, <laughs> but for instance, you know, if, if, if you were thinking about tightness in your life or where there's not enough abundance, you could look for that. Although there is a, an asteroid, Abundantia, that we use mm -hmm. for abundance, but you can be playful with them. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, did you That's see sweet. Alice's question? Oh, no, I didn't. Thank you, Julian. She's just added. Um, Okay, I just love listening and learning. I have a question though for people who have a bunch of planets in one house. Okay, well, what is the question? Um, um, do I need to scroll down? Uh, no, I, th I think she's just meaning what does that mean? Oh, okay, um, sure. Um, it's an interesting one actually, because um, you can have a bunch of planets in one house and then sometimes you might have one house that's completely empty. Um, and what I tend to do in when when there's a bunch of planets in one house, i.e., um, what's known as a stellium, I like to think of it as a daisy chain effect. If you think of fairy lights, um, mm -hmm. the way they're wired, or the way they used to be wired, was one leads into the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And you can probably remember the days of when you got your Christmas fairy lights out. And if one of the bulbs went, <laughs> that was your whole string. <laughs> and you had to go through the whole thing, testing every single bulb. Thankfully, they're not wired like that anymore. But um, the stellium is like one of these old daisy chain of um, Christmas lights. And so where one planet is in a conjunction with another, and another, and another, and another, I actually read the energy of that house to almost like a storybook. So for instance, Gillian's fourth house, the start of her fourth house is where Neptune is. So as we're talking about Gillian's childhood, the very start of her childhood, the opening chapter to Gillian's home and childhood is um, possibly oversensitive and foggy. So maybe when Gillian was born, there was um, an abundance of feeling and sensation that couldn't quite be um, quantified and then the energy goes straight to thought so there's this abundance of feeling and then the thinking function comes in to say I'm feeling this but I'm not sure what it means I must understand what this means and Neptune and Mercury working together is about trying to understand the complex feelings and to be able to articulate in particular articulate them and also go on can I, because actually it might help context. Yeah, cool. that. Um, when I, and my father was farming when I was born. The uh -huh. year I was born, there was a foot and mouth outbreak in the area that we were in. So all the farms were going down round about us. So wow. you know, there was this pop, 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 and the, as the animals were being shot and then smell mm. of burning. That's, that's the year I was born. And towards wow. the end of the first year, my brother nearly died of, of rheumatic fever. So that was the sort of, you know, basically I was yeah. fed put out in the garden, you know. I, I think I had a pram, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, so yes, this was what I was born into. So yes, there was lots going on round about. Yeah, and a, a lot of feelings. Just, it wasn't just losing his, you know, potentially losing his livelihood. You know, so it was basically, there was, everything was being threatened. It was livelihood. It was, mm -hmm. it was the, the, the herd that he built up. So it was... It was his security, it was his comfort, mm -hmm. it was his ability to provide for the family. And at the same time, my mother was going through the same kind of thing and also potentially losing one of her children. Wow. So, so yes, and that was what I was, you know, sort of, oh, yeah. no, world. <laughs> mm. Yes, that's a, that's a pretty big signature, isn't it? Mm. Um, and so with all that sort of com confusion and you know, the energy of, of that, of all those people and um, not having the boundaries 
you know, like when children come into the world, they don't have boundaries, do they? They're connected to their parents. There is the daisy chain effect is to try and understand those feelings and try and put a sense to them. And then the Mercury function is connecting into the moon. And then that's an interesting one with Mercury and the moon. Um, often people with Mercury and the moon want to talk about things because um, Mercury is quite um, a communicator and the moon is about um, sharing, it is about um, us, our emotions, so it's sharing our emotions. So um, when Gillian feels confusing energies, um, there is a need to try and articulate it, which she does from sharing and talking about it. Um, and then this, if the sun was closer, I would link it, I'm going to link it in anyway as a demonstration. Um, the moon, so there is a need to talk about it, to try and understand it, and from that helps to form Gillian's view of the world, and because of that, it helps to form Gillian's personality and inform her, her sense of femininity. So they, they all kind of daisy chain together. And so when you get a planet going over, or in Gillian's case as a, as a child, it informs her um, ability to be a daughter, if that makes sense. Mm. And the, these patterns will just be repeated again and again. I find it quite interesting in um, wedding charts. I spent um, a really long time looking for the best um, time, place and date for me and my um, beloved to get married. And um, we had an astrologer, you know, a fairly well-known astrologer at our wedding. And he said, wow, you picked a really good date. And I was very um, pleased with that. But when I look at wedding charts or event charts, um, where there's a daisy chain of planets, as something goes over it, um, the planet goes through the expression of um, Neptune, then Mercury, then the moon. And so, you know, people relate if you're in a relationship with somebody and, and it's quite um you could almost describe how their arguments go okay <laughs> in a wedding chart so you say okay so at the start it's very confusing and no one's being very clear then you start talking about it and actually digging holes then you get emotional about the things you're hearing um, and and so that's how i would read them so uh, i'm hoping that's helpful alice um um other than that, like, for instance, in Gillian's sixth house, we have an empty house. Um, I would, most astrologers would look at the cusp, which um, is in the sign of Aquarius, and think, what is the ruler of Aquarius? Um, that's Uranus. And read that house by Uranus's position. So, for instance, the sixth house of work and day-to-day -day living, ruled by Aquarius, um, sorry, Uranus, we'd say, well, Julian's work needs to be unusual. Um, it needs to be connected to the airwaves. <laughs> so Facebook counts, but also um, being a channeler, channeling information. It needs to be unconventional. Um, Aquarian energy is also very flat, so it's non-hierarchical. Um, and I'm pretty certain that Julian doesn't believe in airs and graces and people being higher than other people and whatnot. And um, I guess the one love idea, you know, um, brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, so Julian's work really needs to reflect that. Um, Uranus is also conjunct Pluto. Um, so her work is also deeply transformational. Um, and in this opposition to Saturn and Chiron, also um, it, her work comes about through other people's pain. Mm. Um, I just dropped my mouse there, hang on, sorry. Um, does that does that explain and help? Is that interesting? Is it yeah. useful? Mm. Um, Alice has said that is so cool. Thank you, Louisa. It is helpful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you for asking such a great question. Um, is there anything else I could answer? And then I think I might call it a night so I can put this little this little guy down because he's um, worried he might get a bit cold. <laughs> I just say thank you, Louisa, and thank you, Gillian, for sharing this. It is, it's yeah. been extraordinarily interesting and fascinating. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. Um, can I just ask, um, what is your interest in, in astrology? 
Um, I'm very because... curious as to what my chart is now. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, intensely <laughs> curious. Yeah. Um, so I'll, yeah. I'll possibly be contacting you. <laughs> oh, brilliant! <laughs> well, I, but, I mean, um, you know, what 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 did you know about astrology in the first place, and had you seen? Not, a not a great deal. I the, I I had somebody stay with me a couple of years ago who uh, knew a little bit about astrology and she, she, drew, she drew up a, a ch well, she on the internet drew up a chart for me and said, oh, yeah. that's interesting, but I can't quite, I have, I've forgotten how to read it now. And I think I might have a little peek at it now and see, uh, yeah. see what it looks like. But I, um, I certainly, I think it's, I think it's just, the, the depth is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And from, and from my, from what I know of Gillian as well, it's just all seems to fit beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> really, really interesting. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, brilliant. Well, it's been nice to have you smiling and <laughs> listening intently. <laughs> uh, yes, it's been very, very interesting. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Can I just share just one more thing very, very quickly? Just that chart that um, I'm just going to unshare this. Just want to sh just quickly show you the difference of what happens with um... oh the other the other type of <laughs> yeah the right um, one the right one um, <laughs> just so <laughs> just so that you're aware um, when Gillian has shared some of my astrology before she's had a few hecklers or I've had a few well, hecklers. yeah no to be fair the, the yeah the other person that was saying it, I wouldn't say too much because she's actually she's she shared some stuff that's been really helpful at times I'm sure she has yeah uh -huh. um, and then um, so I didn't realize it actually changes my sun sign yeah um there are different ways of looking at charts and um and that's why I, I got confused sorry that's why I thought this was the wrong one no, it's fine. It, it, it's, it is your chart if it's expressed in a slightly different way. And um, you might have heard, um, it, it comes up quite a bit in um, astrological memes about oh, side of real time. Yeah, everything. Oh. So I go into, what, gosh, that's so weird. The difference. So um, all the planets are in the same place. Uh -huh. um, if you look, um, Neptune, um, um, Mercury, the Moon, the Sun, and Venus, but the signs have shifted because um, ah. you know that the um, constellations um, shift, um, you know, by minute amounts. But over the period mm. of say two thousand years, um, it can have a knock-on effect. And so there are astrologers that um, practice sidereal astrology, um, which could change your sun sign. Um, and the signs of all of your planets. Um, sidereal astrology would definitely change your, well, most probably change your ascendant. Um, and in Gillian's case, her ascendant, which was here in, um, in Virgo, is now in Leo. Um, I don't tend to read the star signs too much, um, I don't find them as useful. Normally, what I talk more about is the energy of the planets um, mm -hmm. and the relationships that they have with the asteroids, because I'm much more fascinated by the sacred geometry, the shapes that come up. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I'm happy to read astrology in either system or in, in actual fact, whichever system, there are so many different systems that people can have. Um, but I personally will just use the uh, traditional system unless somebody asks um, but it's just to let you know that um, essentially what has happened is that the clock face has just been reset um, it doesn't change the relationship between planet to planet um, the patterns stay the same they're just reflected in a different star sign which would have a slightly different meaning um, and and I can see this is a valid system for different people the way I would liken it is, um, for instance, uh, I believe Alice isn't in Europe. I, I think she's um, um, possibly in Canada, or in fact, she might just be about to confirm that. Let me just see. Um, she just said she's in yes, Canada. Yes, mm -hmm. she's in Canada. So, for instance, if I said 
this is taking place between nine and 10 or <laughs> 10 to 11 now, um, that would be real for us. That's our starting point. Um, but it wouldn't be true for Alice because Alice has got a different time. So her time is, is set differently, but um, it's not going to change the relationships between us. We're all sit, sat in a circle. <laughs> you know, we're all still here. We're just reflected in a slightly different time zone. Um, I, I would also say that um, if you're actually to look at the constellations of each of the star signs, um, the model that we use in astrology gives each of the signs of the zodiac exactly 30 degrees. Well, if you actually look at, a constell at the constellations from an astronomical perspective, um, the constellations aren't all 30 degrees. Um, you'll see some of the constellations overlap and some of them are really, really big and some of them are really, really small. So the astrological... Um, I, I guess I find this whole, um, if I'm going to be honest, like having each star sign being 30 degrees is incorrect, whichever system you use. Um, and I'm not saying that to rubbish astrology, but what I would say is that if enough people think something, something becomes a thought form. And that's what I think most of us are recognizing at the moment. Um, that when we think great thoughts, it creates more good, it creates more upliftment. Um, when we focus on negatives, more negative things happen. So every thought that we have is a thought form. And so the method of astrology I use, I think has created a very, very strong thought form because so many of us use it. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll happily use the timing or the, the, the set point that um, my customers want to use. And it is kind of interesting to look at it from a different perspective. So for instance, um, the original um, birth chart could be the, the look of traditional Jillian. We could read this from how traditional Jillian has moved on. Um, in which case we could say that Jillian's ascendant, which is saying maybe we could express Gillian's personality. Um, Gillian's personality moves from being Virgoic in its expression into a Leo way. So whereas early on when Gillian was wanting to be very much of service, representing the Virgo energy, she's now becoming a personality in her own right. So <laughs> I, think, I think there are patterns within patterns. So um, I, I completely honour um, however anyone wants to practice their astrology because it's just a tool and I don't think anything is right, anything is scientific. Um, a tool can become a weapon in the wrong hands and it could be something of great beauty in the right hands. And so to uh, the people that say, oh, make sure she uses cider ale, um, I wish them well. <laughs> um, and, you know, hope that they enjoy the astrology that they, they do. And that I'm sure that the right clients who demand that kind of astrology will find those kinds of astrologers um, as the people that want to work with me find me. So. Can I just um, say yeah. one thing, um, Louise? Well, actually, just to, con to sort of concur with what you're saying, one of the reasons I love the way you work is because you're not, not you don't have everything nailed down. You know, it's like sort of... <laughs> This is actually, and working with it. But yeah. um, are you open just to quickly sharing how people can work with you? I think you've got yeah. one. Already. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, um, well, there's a few different ways. Um, one of the ways that's a, a new way to work with me is on a monthly basis of a, a membership um, whereby um, I do a short reading um, every month based on the lunar return of somebody's chart. And just to um, tell you what a lunar return is, every time the moon comes round to the exact place it was at the time of your birth, that marks the, the, the new start of your month ahead. So it might be on the 3rd of June, it might be on the 15th of June. But what I would do is read your emotional chart for the month ahead um, to give you your update. <laughs> 
So you get um, a monthly update, which is approximately about 15 minutes. Um, actually, it's often longer, but <laughs> I say it's 15 minutes and then I like to give a bit more. Um, so I'll give a monthly um, update. Then I do global videos that anyone can watch. But then I do specific ones for my members that have asteroids in. So, for instance, each new moon and full moon, um, I will look at the asteroid picture and give you an update. So the way I like to see the membership is people get an internal update, giving them guidance as to where they're heading um, or where life might be moving them for the month ahead. And also I give them the external view. So, you know, as heads up goes, <laughs> you get quite a good heads up. And then on top of that, um, you also have a question that you're able to ask me at any time during the month um, and, and to expect a great answer. So, um, you know, midway through the month, something might occur and you might think, I'd like an astrologer's view on this. Um, and so customer can just drop me a line and then you'll get a little recording um, with with an answer. And if you give me names and things like that, situations I'll put in the asteroids and <laughs> look for the specifics. No. Um, and the feedback, I've been doing this for five months now and I am actually preferring working that way because I'm getting to know my clients and um, to a much greater um, level because what they're doing really, um, in particular where they really work with me and tell me what their overall goal is for the year ahead, um, we can look at it on a monthly basis and see if they're on target, off target and, and how to get back on. So it's really good if you're really planning something or if you really want to make some kind of real transformational shift. So I'm really enjoying it. On top of that, um, I also give a 25% discount um, for any other products that you buy um, for the first three months. And then after that, that goes up to a 40% um, uh, discount so at the moment I've got quite a few people passing three months membership and now all of a sudden they're booking extra readings <laughs> as the discount has uh, has increased which is great um, so that's one way um, oh also in the month after you've been a member for three months when it's your birthday I will also give you a free year ahead solar return chart reading as well which is 45 minutes so that's the hopefully the benefits. Also, if you didn't, you, as if there's not enough in there, if, <laughs> sorry, I think it's a really good deal actually. Um, if you don't use your question, you can actually gift it to one of your friends. And this is something that a lot of my customers have been doing. So for the first couple of months, they've got loads of questions or, you know, they use their questions and then um, they're able to gift their question to somebody. So um, that all gets hosted on a timeline um, whereby it's a private page on my website, it's password protected, and it's like a relationship between us. Um, so that's that. That's thirty euros a month. Um, so it's. I, I just love it. I, I really love it. Um, but you can also just have normal readings, and most people um, get a ninety-minute reading, um, which is currently one hundred and sixty euros, um, which is about one hundred and forty pounds. And in that ninety-minute reading, it's all recorded. Um, you'd also get a pre and post consultation. So um, I would book in um, a 20 minute call with you to find out what's going on and what you'd like to know about. Then I would crack on and do the reading for you. And then if there's anything that I haven't covered, I'll cover that in the post um, consultation. Um, and so they're my main deals, but there are other readings as well, but they're the main ones that people ask for. I hadn't, I'm glad I asked because I actually didn't realise you crammed all of that in and how cheap it was. I can't believe <laughs> Well, um, well, thanks, Julian. That's good to hear. Um, well, I, uh, yeah, you know what I say, what I think. Oh, about. yeah, you, you'll that's, be upping my... Anyway, that's, that's, no, but it is. It's, it's amazingly generous of you. So thank you. Thanks. Um, the, 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 one of the main reasons it works for me so much is because it means I can um, predict like accurately predict um, how much I'm going to earn. <laughs> so no, I, I, I hear that. It makes more sense because um, where I get um, people buying one reading a year um, mm -hmm. or possibly two, um, now I can sort of plan my finances better. And, it, and I'm actually doing shorter readings for these months. It fits in with being a stay-at-home mum. So um, it works really, really well for me. 
but I do love doing 90 minute readings as well because I can go really in depth. Mm -hmm. That's how I work. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for giving me the opportunity to pitch myself. So the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, used, I would happily, happily, happily endorse all of the, all of the experience mm. of work I've working with you. I've done Thanks. and I've, you know, I really value being able to sort of say, Louisa. <laughs> well, if you think I'll work for any of your friends, please do feel free to tell them. Um, and, you know, I will really uh, appreciate that. But it's been a real pleasure just talking with you tonight. Um, it really has. Thanks um, for doing this, Louisa, because it's, it's great. Um, if at some stage in the future you fancy doing a chat on just focusing on the Lilith, Lilith, because I think it's a really fascinating. Yeah. One. Well, should we, should we schedule it? Let's do it. Because I know even if we could maybe do a bit together in terms of, because there's quite a lot of stuff coming up round about the Lilith piece. I'm sure there is, having seen your chart. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're speaking to Alice has just said um, that is amazing I can listen to you for hours Louise so thank you oh Alice that's so nice I really can't wait till I actually see you in person it's great um, <laughs> I love all your postings as well Alice thank you so right well I think I'm going to say good night so call it a day um, yes, thanks for joining me at night too. Okay, thanks everybody as well. All right. Um, thank you. Good night. Thanks so much. I'm going to say good night. Bonsoir. 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 <laughs> and then um, we say buenoit, EC. Oh, not EC. Aki. Buenoit. Buenoit. In Portugal. <laughs>